Okay, I think we're about ready to get started. Um, so if uh, folks could uh, grab uh, their last plate of food, grab a drink, and uh, uh, grab a seat. Uh, I'll be um, uh, introducing uh, our debaters, our topic on de-alerting. Uh, we're happy to, uh, again, uh, have, this is now our fifth debate uh, in the Pony Debates the Issues series, uh, which is an extension of the online blog that Pony started uh, earlier this year. Um, Pony, the project on nuclear issues, does a number of things. Most of you here are familiar with that. I'll just kind of give you a brief rundown. We do conferences, uh, you know, for a year, three regional conferences in our Capstone Conference in December. Uh, coming up here on December 15th, we're having our Capstone Conference at Omaha at U.S. Strategic Command. Uh, if any of you want to join us for that, uh, you know, let me know. The event page is up online. You can register online quick and easy. Uh, but let me know if you have any questions. We also run a nuclear scholars initiative. Uh, which is basically a six-month uh, series of workshops for young professionals and graduate students who are interested in and working on nuclear issues. We bring them together with uh, nuclear experts uh, to kind of run through the gamut of nuclear policy and operational issues um, and uh, can help them get smart and develop and give them a chance to publish on uh, various and sundry nuclear issues. Um, the blog, like I said, is something we started. Uh, you can find the web address and the materials on your seat. Uh, we started this. Uh, early this year, it's been a big success. Uh, we've kind of worked our way into the nuclear blogosphere, I think, um, uh, fairly seamlessly. And uh, we are happy to have this live component. We're able to take a closer look at uh, some of the issues that uh, we discussed on the blog and at the conferences and elsewhere. So here we're discussing uh, tonight de-alerting. Um, this is uh, it's a tricky issue. Uh, the resolve statement, as you can see, is a bit of a mouthful. It involves a lot of policy and operational um, uh, uh, issues and constraints. So um, uh, we're happy to have Walt Slocum here and John Steinbrunner who uh, will help us work through those and uh, uh, should uh, hopefully um, put on a, another uh, entertaining and successful debate. Um, we've got John Warden who is an intern at CSIS here uh, serving as our moderator tonight. John um, you may not know and doesn't have a bio in the materials. Uh, he is a, um, uh, just re recently graduated from Northwestern with a major in political science and, um, and history. Also a highly successful debater. Um, uh, he was the winner of the, is it the Copley Award? Yes, uh, Copley Award uh, last year uh, that's uh, awarded to the top debate team in the country. Uh, so John, I'll put the, uh, I'll turn the mic over to you and put it in your able hands to uh, introduce um, the format and uh, uh, tell people how, um, how things will proceed from here on out. Thank you. Uh, okay, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Um, the, I guess the only thing we'll add is, uh, unfortunately, Clark can't join us uh, tonight because he's still recovering from illness, but he really loved the format and is really excited that so many of you could make it out to the debate tonight. Um, the format of the debate is we're going to have opening speeches from each side that are seven minutes each, starting with um, Mr. Steinbrenner on the affirmative and then Mr. Slocum on the negative. Then we're going to have a period of cross-examination between the two of them where each will have a three-minute period to ask each other questions. Then there's about a ten-minute period while, where I will ask moderator questions back and forth to each side followed by audience questions where we show we hope to have about 30 minutes where we can have some mics and get all you of you all involved and then finally a three minute closing from each side um, so at that uh, we can start with mr. Steinbrenner with the first affirmative speech okay <clears throat> my case is going to be based upon five assertions, and if we had more time, I'd be willing to elevate them to arguments. Um, um, but so first assertion is that um, it is a basic fundamental fact of international security that for two decades, or nearly two decades, U.S. military investment has been roughly comparable to the rest of the world combined, and more than ten times greater than any plausible opponent. And the implication of that, I guess I better start this to tell me when I'm running down. The implication of that is that the United States itself 
cannot be successfully attacked by any conventional kind, combined arm offensive of any magnitude, um, and that U.S. allies can be protected, defended against such assaults um, with conventional means alone, um, and that that is an adequate deterrent for that particular problem. Second assertion <clears throat> is that it is also a fundamental fact uh, that nuclear weapons are the only immediate source of lethal physical damage to the United States. That's the only way in which we can be hurt to the point that it brings the viability of our society into question. Um, uh, and I would derive from that the implication that it is a fundamental interest of the United States to achieve the greatest restriction on uh, global deployment that is feasible. Um, we have no need for them. They are only weapons against us. Uh, we should restrict them to the extent possible. Third assertion <clears throat> is that the legacy deployment pattern, <clears throat> which features thousands of weapons on rapid reaction alert, pre-programmed for mass attack, um, uh, that pattern greatly exceeds any plausible deterrent requirement that remains. Um, uh, in fact, what it does is embodies the historical inclination to attempt to protect against or to limit damage in the case of war by preempting against the opponent. That is what the configuration of the force uh, is about. Um, and because of that configuration, um, it creates uh, an unjustifiable risk of some inadvertent catastrophe being triggered. It enables a large catastrophe to occur. Um, um, fourth assertion um, is that um, there is an obviously superior de deterrent force configuration uh, the, um, whereby all weapons would be removed to securely protected and continuously monitored storage. Um, and there would be reliably transparent protocols for reactivation, reactivation in the case that there was any immediate requirement. Um, uh, so lock them up and don't bring them out uh, unless you think you need them. Uh, and uh, reassure the rest of the world continuously they are indeed locked up. Um, that configuration would provide uh, adequate deterrence for any contingency uh, since the weapons could be reactivated if required. It would essentially eliminate the risk of an inadvertent catastrophe and would provide a much higher standard against terrorist ac access than currently prevails. Um, fifth assertion is that the interlocking legacy pattern um, of large-scale uh, forces uh, operationally inclined for a preemption if it ever comes to that. Um, that cannot be transformed into the superior configuration by unilateral actions. Um, um, the initiating party would be too exposed to a preemptive attack threat uh, for that to be judged intolerable. So the only way you can get there um, basically is to uh, initiate negotiations to do it on, a, on an agreed schedule under agreed terms. Um, uh, and hence, I would conclude that the resolution should be affirmed. Uh, not only to increase the time available for the authorizing decision, as the resolution alludes to, but to render the operational practices much safer than they currently are. And I think I've only used about half my time. The premise of this discussion, which I think is clear from Dr. Steinbrenner's opening remark, is that deterrence still matters, that it is still a valid national security concern to worry about a possible confrontation with Russia, in which Russian, deterring Russian nuclear attack in a confrontation like that would be a major concern. You can debate whether that's a good premise, but that has to be the premise of this issue. You can certainly debate what kind of force is appropriate or necessary to have effective deterrent in that context, but that's not what we're debating. Those questions are wholly separate from the issue of whether physical de-alerting is a wise, much less a necessary, 
measure while we are still concerned with deterrence. So let's start out by being clear that what the resolution refers to, which is reversible physical changes to substantially increase the time required to launch. What does that mean? First, it would be physically impossible for any American nuclear weapon to be launched until they were re-alerted. Second, the de-alerting would be reversible. They could be brought back to readiness for immediate launch. Third, re-alerting would take significant time, days or more. And it would have to be transparent, at least in the sense that the world would know that re-alerting was underway. And these measures would have to apply to all nuclear forces. Now, there are plenty of technical problems, which hopefully we will have an opportunity to discuss later. Uh, these include how to avoid making the de-alerted components immensely attractive targets, and non-trivially, how you would have an agreement that impacted equally on the SLBM heavy U.S. force and the ICBM heavy Russian force. But let's leave those aside. Let's assume for purposes of argument that you could meet these significant practical and political difficulties. My case against de-alerting rests on two simple points. The first is that it would be affirmatively dangerous in a crisis because it would lead to a mobilization race as each side hastened to restore alert levels, thereby deepening the crisis and creating real or imagined in incentives to preempt. And second, it is not necessary to deal with whatever dangers may exist from having a substantial part of the nuclear force ready to be launched. Let me begin with the effects in crisis, because that's absolutely the most important part of the case. Let's imagine that the United States and Russia have done what the resolution requires. Each side still has a large nuclear force, but that force is entirely off alert. But each side also knows that in a relatively short period of time, they can be brought back to ready status. <clears throat> and for the agreement to be verifiable in normal, time, normal times, if one side starts re-alerting, the other side will immediately know. Now imagine a crisis. Bearing in mind that it is preeminently, indeed, I would argue almost exclusively, in crisis conditions that we actually worry about deterrence in a practical sense. And it is in a crisis that we are most worried, or should be most worried, about foolish and catastrophically regrettable but wholly conscious decisions. Each side knows until it manages to reverse the de-alert, it will not be able to respond to an attack, and the other side will know that it can't. So de-alerting has to be undone to have a working deterrent. It seems clear that each side will then start to re-alert. But seeing the other side crank up its readiness would itself add fuel to the crisis. But it's not just the generalized increased in tension that makes a mobilization race so dangerous. Both sides would realize <laughs> both sides would realize that they would give me like a two minute warning. Both sides would realize that there would be a huge potential cost to coming in second. Because the side that is first will, at least in the eyes of the adversary, have an option to strike before the other side is re-alerted, and an incentive to do so while it has a fleeting nuclear monopoly. So in a U.S.-Russia crisis, in which nuclear restraint is most important, the last thing we want to do is to create a situation in which both sides have every incentive to do things that will, in fact, make the crisis worse. <clears throat> but de-alerting would do exactly that. Thus, de-alerting would bring into the nuclear relationship between Russia and the United States an almost perfect equivalent to August 1914, because the European powers all feared that they would be vulnerable if they did not, and they all depended on mobilization. They all believed that they would be vulnerable if they didn't mobilize, and the resulting mobilization race was in itself a major factor in unleashing a terrible general war. My view is that even a small increase in the risks of stability in a crisis 
is a terrible mistake. And I don't think the cost would be small. But if it were really the case that de-alerting is the only way to reduce whatever risks are inherent in the current situation, it might be worth considering. But that's not the case. Let's start by getting a basic fact about U.S. nuclear weapons straight. They are not on hair trigger alert. Only the President can authorize the use of nuclear weapons. The requirement, and it, not only that he must issue an order, but it's buttressed by a system of electronic locks that can only be released when the operators receive codes that they don't hold. So the right image is not a hair trigger, but a gun with a safety on it. And not only a safety, but a safety locked in place by a combination lock that the person holding the gun doesn't have. If there are weaknesses in these arrangements, they should be fixed by fixing the arrangements, not by making it impossible to carry out orders promptly. Nor is physical de-alerting the right way to deal with whatever risk there is in a misunderstanding about an early, about an early warning. Better warning systems, and in particular, exchanges with Russia and other nuclear powers, a warning information is a far better way to do it. The real problem, and I think at the core of most advocacy of de-alerting, if not most of the anecdotal argument for it, is the danger of preemption. The way to deal with that, however, is to maintain a survivable force, and de-alerting would make, a survival, make the force less survivable. The day may come when the United States and Russia and any other nuclear power no longer believe they need to maintain a nuclear deterrent. But until that day comes, de-alerting in the sense of physical disablement from prompt launch is not only unnecessary, it would add to the dangers in just those conditions in which the risks of deterrence failing are greatest. Well, uh, if you imagine a much more extended conversation, it would have to do with the, his ax, Walt's axiomatic assertion that mobilization, uh, a crisis mobilization would be more dangerous under a de-alert arrangement than it is under the current arrangement. And the current forces do mobilize uh, uh, under crisis conditions out of their normal configuration. So I want to ask, why do you assert that, and why do you think that that is sort of an axiom rather than something that might be designed around? It certainly, it is certainly true that under current conditions, if there was a crisis, you probably both sides would alert forces. But there is a huge difference between an alert arrangement in which you add to an already, and I agree by the way, an already excessive level of nuclear force, and one in which the side that succeeds in mobilizing first has an effect of nuclear monopoly. Maybe not for very long, but the fact that it might not be for very long makes it all the more dangerous. That it creates this pressure to say we have an opportunity on the one side, that we have an opportunity on the other side that we face a danger. And I think that would be much worse in the crisis than the current arrangement. I frankly think that it would be better for both sides if the alert force were a larger relative part of the total force and more survivable. That, and it is not coincidence, I believe, that the British and French, who have no interest in going first, have designed a relatively high alert in fact, the maximum alert they can get out of their force for the maximum survivability. There are good reasons to maintain the triad, but if you had to make a choice, the thing to do would be to build a small, high alert, survivable force. Do I, do I get another question? Are you I'm happy to, you know, <laughs> we, got, we got loads of time. I don't think we're, I don't think, I, I will, I do this for a living. I will waive. I will waive my objection to the time limit, <laughs> and on the condition, of course, that you waive. <laughs> of course. Uh, the why do you contend, or why do you think that that um, it is impossible um, 
to design re-alerting arrangements such that nobody would encounter an advantage or a vulnerability in the course of implementing them. Well, I was going to ask you how you would do that, because I can't imagine how you could have a re-alerting arrangement which was not fit. Presumably, the way the re-alerting would work would be one of the things you've written and some of the things you've written would be you'd have a, you'd have the warheads would be stored separate from the... If you want a really the, radical... the ICBMs. That that's, that's the easiest one in some sense. Presumably, there would be some kind of a monitoring system that would confirm that they were in fact being, they were in fact where they were supposed to be. All you would know is that the monitoring system was no longer in place. The only thing that on-site inspection, to go back 40 years in terminology, only, the only thing on-site inspection tells you is you're no longer allowed to do the inspections. And I think that would be a problem. It's, a, it's, a, it's an alarm that re-alerting has started, but it's not an answer. And moreover, as long as deterrence is an issue, I mean, if you put, we can argue about deterrence, that's a whole separate subject, but as long as deterrence is an issue, the sides will have every incentive to design their system so they can be re-alerted rapidly. And I, I think that is the core of the argument against what I call physical de-alerting. Well, just note that the counter proposition would be that if you got the respective operating organizations and gave them the instruction to design a de-alert arrangement such that the, the crisis instabilities you're discussing would be, if not made impossible, at least minimized, I, I think it is clear that there's quite a lot you could do to break the habit, which is now ingrained, to go to higher and more sort of intense alert in response to perceived threat. But let me, let me pick up on your notion that we are conceding that deterrence is still relevant, which indeed I did. That's not the same thing as saying it's the only thing we care about. And one, one can ask about priority too. And the implicit notion about a radical de-alerting call that would be to subordinate deterrent to, to the higher priority of managerial control. Not to get rid of it, it would still be there, it would still be available. But the revised configuration of forces, I said, would impose much greater managerial control on both sides and between them. And still provide for the mobilization of any deterrent force you thought you needed. Presumably mobilization is not for the purpose of going into a preemption configuration, but going to a retaliatory configuration. Why can you not get there? Well, first of all, I'm strongly in favor of managerial control. That has virtually nothing to do with de-alerting, unless you believe that the only way you can get effective control is by not needing it, by making it impossible to launch the weapons. And then you get into the question of how you transition from a condition in which you can't to a condition in which you can. I believe that the current U.S. arrangements, and for all the business about doomsday machines, I think there's a good deal of reason to believe the Russians, who have exactly the same incentives we do in this connection, have done more or less the same thing, is to build in very strong managerial control into the system. Most, with respect, Lynn Brooks is here, knows more about this than I do, but there are not a whole lot of other people in the room who have had as much exposure to this as Lynn. My view is that the current system makes it as close to physically impossible as anything in the real world is for American nuclear weapons to be launched without two things happening. A valid presidential order, and we can talk about succession and decapitation and so on, but in a day-to-day situation, a valid presidential order, which is acknowledged by the recipients of the order to be valid, and second, the receipt of an outside code. Think of it as a combination to a lot. I really like this analogy. It's a combination to a lot. 
gun with the safety that can only be fired. The safety can only be taken off the pistol if you have a combination that you don't hold that somebody else gives you. Now, I rather anticipate people will say, Barack Obama does not himself hold the codes. I suppose if people assume that's true, I will concede it for purposes of argument. To tell you the honest truth, I don't know. And I'll bet a lot of people who write about it don't know either. But the point is that the people who control the weapons don't hold the codes. So in terms of managerial control, I think we got that problem as close to solved as possible. And if, if people who actually know the facts think there are problems with it, we should look and make sure there aren't. I mean, we've had a couple of really bad screw-ups with nuclear safety and security arrangements, which have nothing to do with this problem, but indicate that things can go badly wrong with things you thought should work right. That's a legitimate thing to worry about, and we should look at it. But it doesn't have any necessity. It is not a situation where the only way you can solve the problem is by simply making it physically impossible for the weapons to be used in a day-to-day circumstance. Well, I'll ask a couple questions, and then we can open it up to the audience. Don't I get to okay. ask any questions? Well, you, you took up time. You can get one in if you want. Okay. Well, I, I actually have a, I have a serious, simple, technical question. Okay. What would you do about the submarine? Um, what would I do what about the submarine? What would you do about the submarine? Keep them is the answer. Um, and um, uh, rig it so that the mobilization for the U.S. at any rate would be into a submarine force. Um, but where, where would the submarine well, – how would you arrange to have the submarines both survivable and not able to be launched immediately? Um, let me give you a procedural answer. Um, I've admitted that, that this is, could only be done by negotiated agreement, okay? There would have to be a working group between the operational okay. managers on both sides, and we would tell them, you guys go figure this out. How do we do this? In a way, and don't tell me you can't do it. I want an answer. Um, I am not going to sit here and invent um, uh, details of physical configuration and operation for the submarines. But I would say is if told to do it, they could do it. Um, uh, and again, we're not – the image is not that we're worried about this sort of uh, bolt from the blue attack that's going to arrive in, in half an hour. Um, what we're worried about is, is giving – some kind of escape valve, if you will, to those people who think that that uh, the residual deterrent effect of simply the stored weapons is not enough. They have to be brandished in some way, and, um, and that therefore you have to be able to do that. Um, how do you do that in such a way that you do not create preemptive potential? I would ask the operational forces to do that. I would ask them to do it in tandem, and I would expect them to be able to solve the problem. Um, Well, I must, given that the United States, the bulk of the United States alert force is in submarines, it seems to me that the answer that somehow somebody else will figure out, that, don't you have any vision of how this would work? I mean, it seems to me the two, one possibility is to keep them out of range. I mean, they'd have to be yeah, a long ways away since the range is high. Is that one of the possibilities? That would be one of the possibilities. And another possibility is you could separate them out. Um, on the submarine itself. Um, uh, but I, I think the point is is not to sort of uh, uh, get too hang, hung up in the, in the – the principle is that we do not want either side um, uh, fearing, if you will, an imminent preemptive attack ever. We don't want that ever to happen. Um, uh, because uh, although what you said about the – uh, degree of managerial control on a given day is, let's say, more or less correct. Okay, it's never perfect, but you know, remember Murphy's law: if something go wrong, it eventually will. Okay, but let's suspend our belief in Murphy's law for the no normal day-to-day -day circumstance. Um, that's not the same thing as forces that begin to worry about an actual confrontation 
and begin to transform their internal arrangements from the overwhelming negative control configuration that does prevail on a given day to positive control, which means I'm going to assure that, that I can operate uh, even under a preemptive threat if I have to do so. Uh, the forces have uh, never really been in that state. They have no experience with that state. As you know, uh, and I irritated, I think, both Amy and Walt by using this analogy, they, they are zoo animals. They've never hunted in the wild. Um, uh, Fortunately. Uh, Fortunately, and we don't want to ever have them do that. Um, but if they did, um, our understanding of the dynamics uh, would be much less assured than you uh, um, uh, suggest. Uh, and I'm just saying that we don't ever want to try to experience a situation in which we have an interaction going on between two forces who are worried about detecting and preempting against preemption, um, and uh, particularly when there's an imbalance in the preemptive capability, uh, the United States having a lot more of it than the Russians do. Um, that is not, under crisis conditions or even mild crisis conditions, a stable situation. We want to stay out of that. That's the whole point of de-alerting. Okay, I'll just ask a couple questions and then we'll get to the audience. Um, one of the, I guess first for Mr. Steinbrenner, what, it, what do you think it would be the scenario or the most likely scenario where the catastrophe that you've described, this accidental or miscalculated launch would occur? I, um, any scenario that involves um, uh, even fairly low level tension between NATO on one side and the Russian military establishment on the other would begin to get us into this territory. Okay, you pick your situation. I mean, um, and I would admit, fortunately, it's a little hard to imagine as we're sitting here today. Um, um, but to say that it is inconceivable, I think, is way outside the bound. Okay, the, the Russians do something sort of provocative in Estonia. The Estonian government cranks down on the Estonian Russians. The Russians mobilize. We decide that that is inappropriate and you begin to get a little bit of a situation. Given the very stark imbalance in preemptive capability between the two sides, including particularly the conventional weapons, we could get in early trouble uh, with a scenario of that sort because the Russian side is worried about um, uh, our preemptive capability um, and we are worried about how they would do. Um, uh, the, this, the other scenario I'll give you from Russian sources. Um, there is a designer of the Russian command system who's retired who has said, if terrorists knew what I knew, uh, it would not be impossible to trigger a launch uh, directed against the U.S. meant to trigger a U.S. retaliation as the apocalyptic uh, scenario of annihilation of terrorism. And he said, we ought to make that more possible, more impossible than it is, and that requires mutual discussion. Um, nobody paid any attention. I'm personally a little nervous about just dissing uh, an argument of that sort because the guy knows what he's talking about in technical terms. Okay, I, I have two follow-up questions and then I'll, I'll move on. Um, the first is the, the scenario you described as the most likely was there was some crisis that triggered it in Estonia, I think was the example you, give, you gave. Isn't that the same type of crisis that would make it so that both sides would start reconstituting their forces so that they would be on high alert. Yeah. And then the second part of my question is um, a lot of times the way people describe the reason that there would be a launch when there's they like see a sign on the radar there's a miscalculated launch is that there's a use it or lose it pressure where we think we have to launch our nuclear weapons before theirs hit the ground in order to take out sufficient numbers of targets. If that use it or lose it pressure exists, even in a de-alerted regime, wouldn't the United States still have an incentive, and Russia as well, to use conventional forces for that same kind of counterforce strike? Um, what I'm trying to suggest is that, that if, you, if you take the uh, uh, nuclear weapons out of the equation on an immediate basis, you have much greater hope of keeping them out, which is what you want. No. I mean, if you get a mild crisis, and that's really all that we're likely to have between NATO on one side and the Russians on the other, 
uh, if the nuclear weapons are de-alerted, they're not going to be sort of brought back in immediately. Uh, uh, the problem is that, that um, the two forces, in particular the Russian force, really are vulnerable to preemptive attack if the other side is cold-blooded enough to do it. Um, and, and there is an imbalance in this regard, just given the inherent, what I said before, the imbalance in military investment and the physical distance between NATO and Russia on one hand being close and Russia and the U.S. on the other being very far away. Um, uh, the point is we do not want to create a situation in which the weaker force begins to be nervous about its ability to handle the situation without appealing to its nuclear weapons and is uh, nervous about its ability to, to preserve its nuclear weapons. And the Russians have every reason to be so worried at the moment. Um, we don't want that situation and that we would be much better off by, you know, the deal or the arrangements that. Um, okay. Um, Walt, um, one of the last things that you said was that um, when the nuclear weapons were no longer needed for nuclear deterrence, you might hope that we would have an arrangement like this. And you also said that crisis stability was the, or at times of crisis, was the times when it was most important that we have stability of our nuclear forces. Uh, do you not think that a de-alerting regime between the U.S. and Russia could have a confidence-building effect that might make it so that it was less likely that there would be a crisis in the future? Crisis, let's take a second step. Nuclear weapons are, are not going to be used or even thought seriously about being used unless there is an exogenous crisis. John is perfectly reasonable in saying you can imagine, even during the Cold War, it took a huge stretch, but it wasn't inconceivable. You can imagine some kind of political conflict that Baltics is a perfectly reasonable one. Ukraine, pick, you know, pick your pick your stand, and I'll invent a crisis to build up around it. That's when you worry about general war. That's when you worry about large forces. That's what nuclear weapons. That's when nuclear weapons become most important and when you have to be most sure that you have a system which will minimize the risks of their being used. And people talk about war by mistake. The chances of a war by a mistake in the sense of an ele electronic glitch that sets off a nuclear weapon, or even somebody misreading a radar or other signal on a day-to-day -day situation is much less than a mistake in the same sense that the First World War, or for that matter, from the Japanese point of view, the Second World War were mistakes. That is, decisions made by leaders under the pressure of time, believing that there was a vulnerability or a potential vulnerability that they had to act so as not to be disadvantaged. And that's what I think is at the core of the problem. Let me just say one word about this issue of the Russian vulnerability of the first strike. The Russians talk about it. I agree. It, look at how, the, first of all, the Russians do maintain, first of all, they maintain some silo-based ICBMs. Second, while they don't maintain a very large submarine force at sea, they normally maintain some part at sea. And second, if the Russians are in this prison, they have the key in their pocket. As long as the price of oil is over about $40 a barrel, they, have, they spend lots of money on defense. And if they really thought that they were vulnerable to a bolt from the blue American attack, all they have to do is to send the goddamn submarines to sea a little bit. All they have to, they've invested a very large amount of money in building a mobile ICBM force. Now, admittedly, most of it stays in garrison. When we were going to build a mobile ICBM force, we were going to keep most of ours in garrison. I didn't think that was a great idea, but it's how we plan to do it. 
And the reason is, and they did this even during the Cold War, the Russians maintained a much lower alert level. Now, you can be cynical, <laughs> and that's because the Russians knew we're going to know when the war started, because they were going to start it. But you can also say the Russians, the Soviets were Marxists, and the Russians are historians. And they agree with what I said a few minutes ago. War starting a crisis. There are plenty of examples of tactical surprise. There are very few examples of strategic surprise. Pearl Harbor was not a strategic surprise. June, June of 1941 was not a strategic surprise. Everybody was screaming to Stalin. His spies, Winston Churchill, Germans who were sympathetic, who didn't want Germany to start a war with the Soviet Union since they know how it would turn out, were screaming at him that, there was a, that the Hitler was about to betray the Nazi-Soviet pact. But the, the Russians maintain this posture because they think when it comes to it, they can mobilize. Now, I think it would be very dangerous. We would be better off both sides if they had a more, a more survivable day-to-day -day force. Not because we're going to they have to worry about it bolt from the blue, but I don't like the mobilization breaks. But that's a choice for them. We agree on what the problem is. It's not sort of a, uh, an accident or mechanical failure. It is uh, an uncontrolled interaction under crisis dynamics. Right. Um, that's that's what we, we have to worry about. Um, uh, and I would just point out that it's a little disingenuous from their point of view for us to say, oh, well, just go build more submarines and send them to sea, you'll be okay, because we, we chase them when they go to sea. Um, we, we play the same game we've always played, um, and, or at any rate, we're sure that we can do it if we want to. Um, uh, and <clears throat> the Russian surface navy um, is just not up to protecting um, submarines at sea against us over an extended period of time. Uh, uh, unless we take the heat off them. <clears throat> and uh, so to say, well, things as they are, we're both gonna, going to uh, conduct traditional operations which are fundamentally hostile, uh, and you just have to do it such that we can't get at you um, and play your part of it. That is not, I would think, um, an appropriate arrangement for the current circumstances. The current circumstances, uh, and let me just talk a little bit more fundamentally. They do require, for many reasons, much more fundamental security accommodation between Russia and China and the United States than currently prevails. Um, uh, <clears throat> and why? Well, we can talk about global warming and the need for um, really dramatic transformation of energy generation globally in that context. Um, we can talk about Iran and the need to sort of be on top of that situation. We can talk about the resonance in both Afghanistan and, and Iraq, and those are lengthy conversations. The bottom line of which is that we have very strong reason to have much more uh, um, stable, if you will, and much more accommodating relationships with both of these countries than we have at the moment. And this is one of the main items of getting there, um, uh, to take us out of what's really an implicit confrontation and potentially lethal one um, and into a more mutually managed situation. Um, and I would contend if we do do that, we are much less likely to have the crisis that gets out of control, much less. Uh, we don't increase its likelihood, we, we reduce it a great deal.
both sides are worried about preemption. There are things Yeah, let's uh, start with some audience questions. I think uh, there are Chris and Mark will be going around with some mics. Um, sure, we'll start down here. Linton Brooks, CSIS. Um, question for each. John, um, I, I was sort of surprised by the suggestion that a confrontation over a NATO member would not lead the Russians to re-alert given that every Russian I've talked to has stressed that it is only their nuclear capability which prevents NATO from invading them today. And so I'd be interested in a little more um, of, of your analysis on why the Russians would, in fact, be willing to, be willing to hold off on re-alerting, because that's Walt's basic argument, that we'll re-alert at the very worst possible time. And for Walt, you, you know my views on that. I mean, I am, I'm on the other side of you from John. But what's wrong, what's wrong with the idea of pulling together, as he suggests, a joint U.S.-Russian working group to see how you would do it if the two presidents decided to do it? Why is that dangerous? They might have other, other more useful things to do. I have no objection to diplomats or technicians talking to each other. I, indeed, with respect, I don't think most people who are in favor of de-alerting have thought through either the technical problems, which are substantial. One of those little technical problems is the vulnerability of the storage. I mean, if all either they're going to be all over the place so that they're not concentrated in a few targets or they're going to be in a few targets which make attractive targets, maybe even, as John points out, for conventional weapons and the time when only we have the level of accuracy necessary to make that danger is not going to be forever. Um, no, I, I, mean, it would, I think it would actually strengthen my side of the argument if there was more serious discussion of how to, how you would actually, what this world would actually look like. I have no objection. I, I, I don't think I ever object to trying to understand problems better. And, you know, maybe, maybe there is some way to solve the submarine problem. I don't think there is. They do. My guess is the Russians don't think there's a way to solve the mobile problem. And incidentally, John is almost certainly right that the Russians, I hope there are no Navy people in the, in the room, or at least no true believers. I think the Russians exaggerate our anti-submarine capability, but presumably that's the reason they've invested in mobile ICBMs, because our anti-submarine capability is not good against mobile ICBMs. Let me uh, concede that's quite a good question, then. Um, and it smokes out the fact that, that – um, I would have to admit, you're not going to do de-alerting and only that. Um, um, it's part of a package for, that would have to include um, uh, quite a bit of understanding about the management of conventional forces. Um, and I would simply argue that, that in the context of such a package, you can, you can prevent, and that would be the whole point of preventing them from, from going to this card, to re-alert the force to blandish it. Um, and the whole point would be, uh, again, reassurance. Uh, the problem with the Russians is not that they're uh, unacceptably aggressive. The problem with the Russians is they're overly fearful, uh, and they have some pretty good reason. Um, and so the, uh, a real policy, this would have to be embedded in a larger policy involving reassurance about the handling of U.S. NATO conventional capabilities, which are pretty threatening to them. If we were in certain that situation, um, if Mexico could do what what NATO can do, we would be screaming about it much more than they have been. Thanks. Um, I have a question about since the president has set the uh, 
ambitious agenda of moving decisively toward lower numbers and eventually zero. Um, to both of you, at what point down that ramp do you get to situations where uh, de-alerting becomes either more sensible or are we considering, for example, in your case, Walt, uh, is it necessary to, in your mind, retain alert forces all the way to zero? Or do we actually get down to a point where, where we are beginning to say, this is where it makes sense? I, I think, as I said, the best answer to that is look at the British and French, uh, who are at a minimum force for it to be viable, given that you can't keep submarines at sea all the time. I mean, in some sense, survivability, which includes survivability of the command and control and, and uh, the force being available when needed, is more important at lower numbers. And in some important sense, it is probably true that if the only thing you're using nuclear weapons for is to prevent a catastrophic attack, an ex a threat to your existence, then probably the, sub, the warheads on a submarine are enough. I mean, if, if all you wanted to do, and I, I don't know, I don't know how the French target their force, but it presumably is not targeted the way we target. It's targeted on cities to cause as much damage as you can and to con at least to convince the other side that that's what you do. Um, and small forces by definition, are more vulnerable to preemption than big forces. And therefore, I think as long as you're going to have nuclear weapons and as long as you're going to have a deterrent, and it's the deterrent problem, not the nuclear weapons, that are the issue. If you assume a world in which nobody is worried about either being overwhelmed with conventional force or being attacked with nuclear weapons, the problem be, you know, it's like, what should you do with the battleships? Put them in museums because we don't, we don't worry about battleship problems anymore. But it seems to me as long as you have that condition and you have nuclear weapons, having them be survivable is essential because otherwise they're attractive target. And survivability includes readiness for use because making them not ready for use makes them less survivable unless somebody can explain to me how that's not the case and nobody so far. I think he would seriously try to do. That, I mean, does that answer your question? Let, let me. Uh, well, tell that to the people who lived in Hiroshima. I think it's fairly clear that as you go to lower numbers, first of all, you have to have a more accurate count than we currently do. Um, at the moment, nobody knows to within a very large number what the worldwide total is because the national accounting systems are not telling each other about that. And they don't have confidence in, in, in sort of reports. So to get to seriously low numbers, we first have to introduce a, a global accounting arrangement that tends over a fairly lengthy period of time probably to something like unit accuracy, and there's a big argument of whether we ever get there given the historic uncertainties about production. Um, but we can certainly get a lot closer than we currently are. Until you can have um, accurate accounting of the numbers, you're not going to get either low numbers, or you're certainly not going to get zero or anything like that. Um, um, so the way to think about this is that if you want to go in that direction, um, that is one stage you have to go through. Uh, a global accounting arrangement so we have an accurate account. And I think as you reduce the numbers, whatever they are, um, um, that, that pretty sort of sharp restrictions on alert rates are going to be necessary in order to avoid the uh, um, uh, preemption problem becoming greater as you go to lower numbers. Um, and I think we just disagree on how hard it would be to work that out. Um, uh, I think it can be worked out. Um, but all I would say is that anybody who wants to advocate global zero has got to, I think, first advocate a global accounting system that includes all weapons and fiscal material 
um, and recognize that it takes quite a long time to get there. We're not anywhere near that at the moment. Um, uh, and I would argue that as a part of establishing such an accounting system, uh, taking them off alert is one of the natural things you would do. Uh, given what you said, Walt, I'm just wondering, would you advocate then that India and Pakistan should be on alert? That is, because I don't want to see that. If, if uh, no, I think one of the real problems with the India-Pakistan situation now is that, well, again, I, I don't know and I doubt it more than a handful of people do know, for sure. But it seems pretty clear that they, they're in the situation that in some sense I worry about. That is, the because they're they're relying mostly, presumably mostly on airplanes. Uh, that they, in a crisis, they would either have to hurry up and get the weapons allocated to the ap operational delivery systems, and there would be a temptation to try to interrupt that process. I mean, if you were the Indian general staff, and there's a crisis, I mean, it's hard enough, it's hard to imagine a crisis between NATO and Russia, it's unfortunately easy to imagine a crisis between India and Pakistan. We have one every five years or so. We're due for another. The, it's hard to, if you, if you were in the Indian general staff and you saw the Pakistan beginning to do whatever it is they have to do, which is presumably get gravity bombs out of storage and put them on F-16, you, know, you don't need a nuclear weapon to interrupt that process. Would, the Indians are reportedly muttering about getting submarines, which would be a good thing, because the, at least they would be in a, in a secure situation where they wouldn't have to worry. It, it's probably equally true that if the Pakistanis believe they have the capability to do anything about it, they would have the same temptation to try to interrupt the, the Indian mobilization process. I also don't believe that these countries will stay in this situation. Nobody's had nuclear weapons. Has the Chinese have now begun finally to get serious about a survivable force? They're, even the Israelis, by all accounts, are putting stuff on submarines because it's <laughs> they, they've got it. anything on land in Israel is even more vulnerable. But I think good. and it is a good thing that they are survivable. In order to be survivable, in my view, they have to be, in some sense, on the way. I have a, a question about the, the race to, le uh, to re-alert that Mr. Slocum uh, cited. Presumably, if we were in a de-alerted, uh, de demated state, we'd have more warhead storage areas than we have now, and there would be more dispersion of them other than within the, the ICBM bases and other places. Um, so I'm, I guess my question is about the, this window of uh, vulnerability that you refer to. Do you think that one side could have such complete confidence that they knew which warheads were in storage areas, in transit, being loaded onto ICBMs and, and elsewhere, that they could confidently launch a counterforce strike without fearing any sort of, of um, you know, second strike retaliation? So, you know, is the, the fact that Warheads would have to be transited from a storage site to warheads. Enough ambiguity to provide deterrence in a crisis in and of itself. I could answer that better if somebody had a concrete illustration of how they were going to do it. But the de-alerting has to be verifiable. I, I take it that we're talking about a verifiable arrangement. I guess you can imagine an arrangement in which you don't know where the weapons are, you only know that the launchers don't have them on them. You're either going to have to monitor the launchers or monitor the weapons. And the one that you monitor, you're going to know where they are. Not necessarily. It's a little hard to imagine a monitoring system 
doesn't include knowing what uh, it is. Talk right. to Richard Garland. He's well, I, did, I have talked to Richard about this, and Richard is an advocate of de-alerting, but he's also honest enough to say that the problem of submarines is a very, very tough problem. And if Richard Garwood can't think of a cute technical solution to a problem like this, it's a hard problem. I, nothing is presumably insoluble, but I've, I've, I have not only respect but genuine affection for Garwood. He has had some great ideas, some of which I wish we had had the sense to implement. Um, but the, the problem is, I will tell you one of the things I would worry about is that the first country to get a nuclear weapon ready on alert and available would propose a freeze on re-alert. That is, because the process is going to be, has to be transparent, at least to know that it's starting. And the first, the first side, we get a submarine to sea and we do whatever it is to make it effective again in in range. And we then announce this is a, accurately, this is a dangerous situation and we should both stop. And the penalty for not stopping is we will do things. I mean, you can, you can play out the scenario. And I also think you have to take seriously that as long as deterrence is relevant, people would design the force so that it could be rapidly re-alerted and in a way that was hard, hard to interrupt. Particularly, it was fast. Uh, thank you. Um, I noticed the question asks for physical means of impeding the re-alerting process, and I was wondering if either of you, neither of you, so far has addressed, so I would call social or political means of impeding the re-alerting process. So, for instance. With physical means, perhaps you can delay this for 90 hours, let's say. And according to uh, Mr. Slocum, it, there will be a race for each side to get it done in 80 hours instead of 90 hours, and whoever's slowest loses. Uh, but if we were to do something more creative in a political sense, uh, if we had some international troops and monitors on each side monitoring these weapons and saying, okay, if one side or the other side wants to re-alert, you both have to do it a little bit at a time simultaneously. Say, you know, a few weapons here on each side, whether it be 10 or 5 or 20 or whatever you think is the right number in, in a right amount of time, instead of 90 hours to re-alert in a race to be the first, you could have 90 days to re-alert so that we don't have a nuclear war starting within the first 100 hours of a crisis. And in 100 days, or 90 days, or 60 days, there's much more time for each side to think about it and perhaps come to a solution before we get to uh, this <clears throat> nuclear war. I think you're identifying the, the basic spirit of the real idea there. Um, um, physical, any physical mechanism would not by itself be adequate. Um, um, and the whole idea involves weaving around very elaborate rules such that um, the rule is thou shalt not sort of indulge in a re-alerting race to blandish weapons in the other guy's face. Um, and that you will uh, back up those rules with not just sort of agreements in principle, but operational practices that sort of uh, basically provide reassurance that we're going to honor the rules. Um, and the whole point of this is to keep out of the uh, crisis circumstance in which uh, the alert process begins and, and one side or the other or both simultaneously begin to worry about a real imminent preemptive capability. You want to keep them away from any serious preemptive capability in the immediate circumstance. And of course, you would, you would associate it with a lot of monitoring rules. Um, and various reassuring arrangements to try to prevent that, which is why I don't accept Wall's characterization of the situation. They would inevitably erase, and it would be more dangerous than not. No, I think we can fix it so that that is decisively not true, um, and that there is um, uh, 
uh, not only the physical de-alerting, but a set of rules that effectively prevents this kind of behavior. Uh, would it make it physically impossible? Uh, maybe not. Uh, but it can, you can make it a lot more less likely to occur than it currently is, and that's worth doing. I would like to live in a world in which the relationship among states was the kind you described. We have an arrangement like that now called the NPT. And I think it works fine for countries that want to play by the rules. It, it assures us that Japan does not have nuclear weapons, which Japan, I mean, somebody said, the question of whether Japan has nuclear weapons is like the question which was more true in the, in the old days than now. Does Switzerland have an army? Today, no. Tomorrow, it has an army of 400,000 people. Uh, that it works, the, the NPT system works fine for countries that understand that it is in their interest to continue to play by the rules. But if you, if you begin by the hypothesis that the sides, both sides will play by the rules, they're not going to have a crisis of this kind. It will be like the kinds of crisis, crises we have, you know, over bananas and stuff like that. That's um, the whole point. I, look, I, I would like to see a world like that, and with respect, I think there are a lot of things that can be done that begin to advance toward that. Let, let me just address the preemption issue to show that not totally troglodyte on this question. I think the United States relies too much. We don't, we don't have to. What we should say is because we have a survivable force, we do not, for deterrence, need to rely on preemption in any of its variants from preemption in the sense that we think, the, we think they've decided to, we think they're preparing do we think we see the missiles in the air? We don't need to rely on preemption. We should not do something which I think we tend to do, which is a mistake, which is to define what the full force, the full alerting force is capable of as what is, quote, necessary for deterrence, and therefore you get this argument, well, deterrence will be less satisfactory if we don't have the alert force and we don't fire it off where it will be fully effective. There are a lot of things we can do that will reduce the preemption risk. Uh, and I think we should do it. And they will involve some quite substantial changes in how we do business. You can't change the fact that physically, if you have, an, uh, if you have a survivable force, you have a potential, you can always fire first. But there are a lot of things we could do that would reduce the reliance on, on any form of preemption and, and argue exactly what, what that covers. Look, I. I, I am afraid that the record is that the only thing you really know if you're dealing with somebody who wants to violate the rules, the only thing you really know is that he's, he's turned off the monitor. You know, that's why the North Koreans kick the inspectors out. That's why the Iranians run the, do all these games with the inspections. That's why Saddam did the same thing. And it, and it produced a war, a war by mistake. I'm, I'm, I'm deadly serious when I say if everybody would agree to play by the rules and you, everybody was confident that everybody would play by the rules, it would be a much better world. We probably wouldn't need nuclear weapons at all. Then we could, in fact, go to zero. But that's I would say, therefore, begin to develop the rules that everybody is induced to play by. Um, the, the, and underneath that argument is the question of, are we dealing with intrinsic threats, i.e., ones that are motivated by some impulse for hostility, or are we dealing with derived threats, ones that are motivated by fear of what we might do? Um, and I, I think if we have a difference is that I am primarily concerned about derived threats, um, which is why I emphasize the relative uh, uh, superiority of U.S. forces. I think it gives us a lot of derived threat problems. And Walt is still sort of validating or sort of worried about intrinsic threats. And if there's a fundamental difference, and if, I mean, clearly the world has both. So it's a question of uh, what's your relative weight on these two things. <clears throat>
it seems that uh, two of the big problems uh, that both of you have been speaking of tonight with uh, de-alerting is the uh, survivability of the force and uh, the temptation to preempt uh, in time of crisis. It, yeah. And it occurs to me that if we're on our way to Global Zero and uh, we happen to get uh, arms reductions into the hundreds rather than thousands of warheads, that we enter a realm where uh, missile defenses might actually be a means of solving both of those problems. And I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Uh, if you're willing to put <clears throat> very drastic restrictions on the offense, um, and that's my, not just numbers. There are other restrictions that go along it. Maybe you can make missile defenses work, but they're dependent upon those restrictions. Um, we are not inside of a missile defense system that can stand up to an optimized threat, basically. Um, and uh, so, yeah, if, you, if you're a devotee of missile defense um, and you're willing to engage in very restrictive rules about offensive deployment and uh, then, then you can imagine a missile defense system that might provide a meaningful system. We're not inside of such a thing at the moment. Yeah, I, I underscore imagine. I, I am in favor of the kind of missile defense that we are, in fact, building, which has got some reasonable capability against very small attacks. And unsophisticated ones. And you can argue very small includes very small sophistication as well as small numbers, if you want. Um, but, I mean, I'm, John will accuse me of living in the past, but you probably know the argument that one of the arguments against missile defenses is they allow you to clean up your mistakes from your preemption. And you, know, you can't entirely avoid that problem. Uh, well, one of the arguments for limited missile defense is that if you think there's any possibility of accidents and so on, it may give you some may, some way of dealing with those. I don't think that's an argument that would justify a missile defense program in and of itself, but it's a kind of unearned increment. That I uh, and I can even understand the argument that if you had a high confidence system that there were no nuclear weapons and no missiles capable of delivering them. Which is, I mean, if you're not, if, they're, if you're really certain there are no nuclear weapons, ICBMs are a pretty expensive way to deliver high explosive or even chemicals. Uh, then you know, having some having some kind of missile defense against a, by hypothesis, non-existent threat, <laughs> it'd be quite good. I don't think missile defenses are the answer to the U.S., Russia, or even the China problem, or even the Indian problem. All right, let's take two more questions, and then you can have your closing statements. Thanks. Um, I have a pretty simple question that I'm guessing both of you might have thought about. Um, to, what, to what extent might de-alerting either increase or decrease U.S. vulnerability to non-Russian nuclear attack. I'll be happy to concede that if the only thing we had to worry about was rogue state attacks that put China to the side because we don't know where China will be in 20 years, um, then because there's very little danger, there's very little that the, the other side could probably do to interfere with our re-alerting, I wouldn't worry so much about. I mean, the whole problem of what kind of a nuclear world you would want if there were no Russia and no Russian nuclear weapons, and and no, and also probably no China problem, is a is an interesting one that would certainly be worth thinking seriously about because maybe we'll get there someday. Um, I, <laughs> you you won't be surprised in my answer is probably still you'd have one submarine with a few missiles in it because it's there and it can't be found. And you worry about the Russian. You know, we don't worry much about Russian ASW. We worry a good deal less about Iranian ASW. Um, but it, it, it's, it's, that's, a, that's a, a good question. And if you assume a way in the potential of a U.S. or maybe a U.S.-China 
then the, the whole question of what kind of nuclear force you would want and what kind of nuclear posture you would want is, is very difficult. It, it's mainly a U.S.-Russian problem. Um, and the two sides have a long way to go before other players become very significant, but you can be sure that they're not going to go all the way, whatever that means, without bringing the others in. So you're not going to have a situation in which the United States and Russia have this totally de-alerted arrangement and there's no constraint on anybody else. That ain't going to happen. Mr. Davison, National War College. Mr. Steinbrenner, you began your talk with uh, five assertions. Uh, part of the first one was that U.S. allies can be protected by conventional means alone. However, this ignores the U.S. extended nuclear deterrent over our allies, and that extended deterrent relates to uh, providing our allies reassurance about threats that are not necessarily from Russian nuclear forces. They could be from North Korea. They could be from other regional rogues. They could be from China. Can you please address how uh, your proposal would affect the U.S. extended nuclear deterrent? I would accept that under any arrangement I'm talking about, nuclear deterrent would be extended to allies. That means core deterrent, deterrent against a nuclear attack. My statement was we have no need to apply nuclear weapons to any other form of attack, even in protecting allies. So yes, of course, if somebody imagines that they're going to attack a U.S. ally with a nuclear weapon, the U.S. deterrent would be applied against that situation. If they're proposing to attack it with conventional forces, there's no need and no justification for evoking U.S. nuclear weapons. We can handle that and should handle it with conventional means. Extended nuclear deterrence, not extended to other forms of attack. Of course, it would be available. I'm The U.S. Did, uh, well, okay, I mean, the deterrent arrangement is going to allow for reactivation. Um, so I don't know what you mean by timely. What, what do you imagine an attack that somebody outside the system of the alerting can um, – well, the arrangement is not going to uh, – that I'm talking about is, is a broader security arrangement. North Korea is not going to be – allowed to have a nuclear weapon to wield around under these circumstances, nor are the Iranians. Um, uh, you're not going to get the alerting unless you clean up those problems. Um, and you can't. Uh, uh, and I think it would help, actually, in some ways, if we do this to, uh, to uh, be sort of more decisive, or at any rate, acceptably decisive about those circumstances. No nuclear weapons, either in North Korea or in Iran or anywhere else. Um, now, we do have the residual problems. Of, I'll mention the Indians and the Pakistanis are a big problem. Um, and uh, uh, if you want to worry about one of them using a nuclear weapon against a, a U.S. ally, then you have to worry about com comparable rates of availability and all that sort of thing. But I would imagine if, if a de-alerting standard is set between the United States and Russia, that same standard could be applied to everyone else and would be, certainly before it goes to completion. Okay. Um, if you all – I can – Heavy pressure here. <laughs> the um, uh, let me just admit that that essentially uh, the statement I might make at this point would be inappropriate under these circumstances. And, uh, 
No, I was going to suggest is that I acknowledge that talking about de-alerting um, in this town at this moment, if not in this room, some people in this room may be more amenable to it, um, is a bit like talking, like I was imagining, let's think of an analogy. Um, and I'm imagining, what if somebody, a civil rights leader, went to try to talk to a, a very exclusive southern country club in the 1940s about their rules of discrimination? Um, and I would imagine the conversation would have some of the same character. Completely unimaginable um, for nearly all of the members. Um, and the few that saw that maybe there was a point to the question would not imagine that anything was going to happen anytime soon. Okay, and but lo, this 60 years later, a fair amount along those lines has happened. Um, and I, my sense is that this this issue is of this character. Um, it has to do with basically civilizing um, a relationship which is unacceptably and unwisely confrontational. Um, and those people steeped in it. Um, uh, who currently dominate the relationship have a very difficult time imagining how that could ever happen or should ever happen. Uh, I at least am willing to hope that 40 years from now, and I won't be around to see it, uh, it will have happened. And you can that maybe provoke a kind of I'd be I would be very happy if the world changed so that the broad context that John describes prevails. It might happen. For the moment, I just rip. What is it that we say that, uh, that lawyers put in that I? Everything that I said before is hereby repeated as fully as if it was set out fully herein. 